Welcome to the History Nerds United Podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Today, author Bob Thompson and his book, Revolutionary Roads. Basically, it's the American Revolution road trip. Really enjoyed this book. Love talking to Bob. We even got a little controversial. We did not necessarily agree on everything from the American Revolution. I love talking about this. I had so much fun. I want you to hear it, so I'm going to shut up. Let's do it. And here we are with author Bob Thompson and his book, Revolutionary Roads, Searching for the War that Made America Independent and All the Places is Good Have Gone Terribly Wrong. Bob, thanks so much for coming on. Glad to be here. Bob, let's start with a quick one, easy one, true or false. You have written two American history books, but you dropped out of your American history graduate program. Uh, that is true, but if you talk to me long enough, you'll discover that I always hedge and say, well... What you really need to know about the American History Graduate Program is I was only there for three weeks. <laughs> so they didn't get you too indoctrinated or anything, so you can go in fresh no, on everything else. No, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought I got there and I thought, oh, I guess maybe you don't want to do this. Well, I mean, you certainly got a lot of writing. So uh, the Washington Post is was one of your main stops and everything. Did, did that prepare you for this type of history writing that you've done recently? Uh, for the most part, um, I never wrote a book for the Washington Post, and writing a book is a is a somewhat different thing. But I was a, both an editor and a reporter and writer for the Post feature section and the Sunday Magazine, where back in the day those were really long pieces, and so that was it was wonderful. It was a fantastic thing to be able to learn to do. And also the thing that prepared me by being at the Post was when I went to the Post, I was an editor and had never really been a reporter or a writer. And I had kids and thought maybe I should not work so hard or it's not really work so hard. It's I shouldn't work to such a firm schedule where I was never home at dinner time. So I said, eh, you know, I want to put this editing job. And they basically let me futz around and learn to write and report on their dime for quite a while. It was great. So yes, that helped me enormously. And I also, I wrote a lot of history, history related stories for them. Well, I think it's interesting too, that, you know, you have, you have two books, history books, and they're kind of, uh, I'm calling them road trip history books where you're sure. physically getting out there. Was that kind of just an easy transition for you? Because the books become almost basically pieces of history connected with interviews with, you know, super nerds like ourselves. It was easy for me on one level because I was a reporter by then. And I'm not a historian, although I've followed history forever and know a lot about it and whatnot. But my rule on both books really was if I go into an archive, I'm toast because I won't have time. I like writing first person. And I like the traveling, and I loved meeting the people, a lot of whom are very different from me. So it was, it was a great thing. I mean, Bob, that's a lot of traveling, though. Why don't you like to be at home? I love being at home. I avoid not getting home to my bed as much as possible. Uh, you know, Brendan, I traveled for the current book for something over a year and a half. The whole book took me seven years, so I was at home a lot. <laughs> That's a pretty good ratio. That's not too bad, actually. Yeah, I don't want to be at home anymore. <laughs> Before we jump into Revolutionary Roads and start kind of digging into some of this history, I did want to mention that maybe we can call him the best friend of the podcast. James Kirby Martin is referenced in here. Jim has been on this podcast multiple times. How did you get connected with Jim? I went to a conference at Fort Ticonderoga. And I went to the conference because I had to be there anyway, and it was I was reporting in the area, and it looked like a great conference. There were great people there. I didn't know Jim, and he was one of the speakers, but I did meet him before the conference started and met another guy who turned out to be very important to me, Bill Welsh. And they, you know, we were chatting and I said what I was doing. And one of the things they did was they said, there are these guys in the South that you really need to know. I think that was mostly Welsh and, and, and Bruce Matter who were doing that. I mean, he's another one that I, I never know where he is at any given point in time. It seems like right. he's everywhere all at once, and they are almost always American Revolution sites. It's amazing. So what made you decide Revolutionary Roads? How did the idea come together? Because you said this is, this is long gestating. So what made you say, like, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I'm going to focus on? 
Well, I had a bunch of other ideas and my agent and or my editor were less enthusiastic about the other ideas. And then I had this idea. I can't actually remember, honestly, how it came up. I mean, I, I thought about I wanted to travel. The, the Davy Crockett book was a traveling book, and I wanted this to be a traveling book. And so I tried out various traveling ideas, and this is the one that people said, oh, okay. So that's how that happened. It wasn't because I woke up one morning and said, I really must write a book about the American Revolution. Although I should probably pretend that happened. What was your actual first stop? I remember, I know what's the first part of the book, but what was your first stop when you're saying, all right, I'm going to basically walk the American Revolution, drive in between, but walk some of it. What was your first stop? First stop was Lexington. And um, the book is more or less chronological in the way I tell it. Not totally, but mostly. But I did not travel to places chronologically because um, it's just not efficient to, to, to not do what's in the area. But Lexington was the first stop. Uh, one of the reasons was I, had, was I had a very good friend living nearby who had a guest room. Uh, and um, so I just walked on to Lexington Green one day, it was the afternoon after I drove in, and there was a kid standing on the green with a tour guide uniform on. He was dressed as a militiaman, and uh, I started talking to him, and he was great. He's not in the book, unfortunately, because not everybody is, but that's that's where I started. One of the big selling points of your book is you pull out these things that not a lot of people know. Right, that it's not just American Revolution that you're going to read in a history book for you know high schoolers. Do you ever worry about, especially where you were going, that you might not get those extra little details, or was it just guaranteed if you showed up and really started looking into it, there was going to be stuff not everybody knew? Well, nothing's guaranteed. There's a thing called reporter's luck, which is a true term and and it's a real thing. Although reporter's luck is usually based on reporters working hard, so I don't mean to say it's not. But my reporter's luck in Lexington had to do with going to a historic house where Hancock and Adams had been staying at the time of the British movement towards them. And I took a tour of the house and a really smart woman from the Lexington Historical Society gave me the tour. And then I talked to her for a while afterwards and told her what I was doing. And she stopped and said, wait, let me check the schedule for the other historic house on the other side of the town. They had three of them, actually. And see if John Dennis is still there, because if he is, you must immediately go see him. And I believe she also said that he will talk to you for two days about Lexington and Concord if you wanted to. So I took her advice and I got to a tavern on the other side of Lexington. I'm not good on recalling exact names on the top of my head, but... There was John, and he turned out to be as advertised. He knew everything about the history of the war in Lexington. I was a little terrified of John, actually, because he was highly critical of some other historians who shall remain nameless. But reporter's luck, one person leads to another. Um, as I said, when I met Jim uh, and these other guys in Ticonderoga, I think in, in retrospect, it was mostly the other guys who said, oh, there are these guys in the South, you have to know. And they gave gave me three names. And when the time came for me to go south, which was, you know, that was in the winter. I went south in the winter and reported in the north in the summer. Bill Welsh just emailed those guys and said, hey, pay attention to this guy. He wants to talk to you and he needs to know about the south. And they were great. If you've looked at the book, one of those guys is the one who gave me the tour of the Battle of Cowpens right at the beginning. Now, I, I do have to say, I'm sure reporter's luck is a thing. However, Anybody who loves history and is a history nerd knows there's no such thing as a quiet history nerd. Once you hit on whatever they're a nerd about, they're never going to shut up. Some of them create podcasts because they won't shut up. It's amazing. <laughs> now, Calpens, um, I went uh, to military college, went to West Point, and Calpens is a big deal. A, lo a lot of people haven't heard of it, but Calpens is a huge deal when it comes to military science and the American Revolution. Can you give me a quick kind of overview of Calpens and why it's such a big deal? Well, I can do that. The first question I want to ask you is, at West Point, did they talk about how it was like a battle in, between the Romans and the Carthaginians in whatever date it was? 
Yes. Now, when we read about it, it's a question of whether or not everything happened as planned or whether it was a bit of serendipity. It depends on which primary source you go to, whether or not the whole thing was planned out and it worked perfectly or everything kind of broke the right way on that particular day. Oh, I'm here to tell you that it was not all planned out perfectly. <laughs> that not that Daniel Morgan didn't do a, as good a job as he could planning it out. Daniel Morgan being the hero of Cal Pence, one of them. Uh, but absolutely not. And the thing, Cane, I don't even know how to pronounce it. The Roman Carthaginian battle is called Cane or Cane. Cane. And the famous thing about it is it's a double envelopment. This is for history nerds, you know. Both wings of one army crash into the other army. It's a very bad thing to have happen to you, uh, which did happen at Cowpens, but it was never planned. It wasn't like Daniel Morgan. I mean, he wasn't walking around in his head saying, I'm going to be like the great general at Kenne. But he was one of the first, and I think this is really what you know people key in on is, it's the first time that the American army was using real tactics, tactics that have been explained and followed through on and things like that. And of course, if your tactics are pretty good, it usually means your luck is going to go up as well. I wouldn't say it's the first time they ever used tactics. It's the first time they used a particular tactic, which was designed to enhance the role of militiamen as opposed to the regular army. And Morgan's force had both. It was designed to use them in a way that they could handle and not put them in a situation where they couldn't handle. And if you put militia in the front line and expect them to stay there when British regulars come at them with bayonets, they will not stay. I would not stay either. That's what Morgan realized. And he said to them, we're going to put you there. You're going to fire twice or three times. It's not nobody had a recorder when he was saying what he said to them, but two or three times. And then you were going to retire in an orderly fashion and leave the rest to the to the regulars, to the Continentals. And that part of the plan worked pretty well. They did not all get off two shots. They, maybe some of them did, but they got off one shot and it was pretty harmful. There were a lot of them. There were more of them than most of the hist history books say. There's been more recent information about that. And so they did a lot of damage, and they did retire in good order. The, the Continentals who were behind them, kind of invisible to the British over just a little rise, but the Continentals opened up and they let them through because they knew what was going to happen. But then the question becomes, do the militia ever come back, or is that the end of them? But then it was up to the Continentals to fight the British regulars. And that's where things got interesting. I mean, it is a – and yes, for those who are listening who don't normally hear military terms, yes, they knew the militia would run away. So they're like, let's just leave them in there for a little while, and then they're going to run away like they normally do. And let's just tell them to be nice about it, do it in an orderly fashion. Right. Well, yeah. They, they did not want them to run because running is contagious on a battlefield. And uh, that part worked very well. And especially learning about cow pens, it brings up something that I have mentioned, and it's a verb that I have created for the podcast, which is um, Mel Gibsoning history. And Benastri Tarleton, who lots on him, he's he was a bad guy, depending on who you're talking to. He was very effective, probably very brutal, but. I remember the villain in The Patriot by Mel Gibson, which I absolutely hate for butchering history. The the villain is basically based on Benastri Tarleton, who was in charge of Cal Pens on the British side, right? The part about being in him in charge of the Brits at, at Cal Pens is correct. And all, all of the mixed feelings about him that you mentioned are correct, although mostly negative. Yeah, if you're an American, screw that guy. He wasn't very nice, and he killed a lot of people, and it wasn't in a very sporting way. But now have, I can ask, um, I know maybe Mel Gibson wants to turn your book into a movie, but did you enjoy The Patriot or did it drive you nuts like it did me? I never watched it. Don't do it. The, congratulations, no, Bob. No. Don't do it. Now, another revolutionary figure, and I, I personally have never liked him. I think you went slightly easier on him than I would have, is Charles Lee. Now, from your perspective, who's Charles Lee? What was his deal? And how was he kind of seen by history? 
Charles Lee was one of a couple of important former British Army officers who joined the rebel side in the revolution. The other was Horatio Gates. Lee was exceptionally smart, knowledgeable about all kinds of things besides military stuff, which impressed congressmen. He was strategically not a fool. I don't know whether you've ever seen the, in many ways, totally wonderful musical of Hamilton, but they have a bit on Charles Lee, which is, which is completely false. He was an experienced general. He wasn't an idiot. He also was a man who could not keep his mouth shut, could never uh, show respect to anyone, and that was what got him in trouble. One more thing about Charles Lee, however, is that he is arguably the person who prevented a terrible American defeat at Monmouth, which was a big, important battle. And that is not the way history remembers him. I mean, he ended up the scapegoat for that battle. And I'm just going to make a plug for a book here, because the reason I got real interested in Monmouth and Charles Lee was that a book called Fatal Sunday came out while I was reporting. You can call this reporter's luck, or you can call this, oh my God, do I have to deal with Monmouth? I'm too busy. <laughs> but the book is by Mark Edward Lender and uh, a colleague who was mostly involved in the map side of it, which is really important in terms of figuring out things. And that's the best book on Monmouth, I believe, that there will ever be. And if you want to know about Charles Lee, that's where to go. Don't, don't listen to me. Uh, get a copy of that book. And now my favorite revolutionary character, anybody who reads the blog, I won't shut up about him, the Marquis Lafayette. He's my favorite, and he is in your book, which, I mean, if you're writing an American Revolution, he should at least get a footnote somewhere. How do you view him, right? Some people make him a bit more outsized that, you know, he did some of these things. And then it seems like a lot of historians want to minimize how important he was to the revolution. Where do you see him on that scale of how important he was in the greater struggle? Lafayette had never been in a battle before he arrived as a volunteer in the United States. He would had some military training, but it was peacetime. So he had never fought a battle. When he arrived, he arrived with a piece of paper from Benjamin Franklin and uh, another American representative in France saying, make this guy a major general. And there'd been a few people from France showing up with those papers and they had caused some trouble. And George Washington, among others, was not too happy about this. You know the standard story on Lafayette and Washington, which is father, son, they loved each other. I don't know about the father-son part, but they did really come to care for each other and were really good friends. But here comes a guy who's supposed to be a major general, and Washington doesn't even know whether he's supposed to actually give him troops or not, because he doesn't know what Congress intends. And he says, okay, come on, you can be on my staff, but at the first battle, you know, just just watch. You know, just don't stay on the sidelines. I'm answering this question in too long a fashion, so let me just say briefly that when you are a rookie, it is problematic when you're put in important positions. And he made tremendous blunders at both a little a little battle called Barren Hill, which is now called Lafayette Hill, naturally. That's right. He made blunders at uh, Monmouth, which in the preliminaries to Monmouth, which caused him and part of the reason that Charles Lee replaced him as, as, as the leader there. And there's a little battle called Green Spring in Virginia, where came very close to having a very important segment of the army wiped out. His performance in Virginia on the whole was good, but that's, we're talking 1781 here. And he arrived in 1777. And so I should ask you, what did he do before then that was important? Because I don't know. Well, my thing is, number one, it always helps to be fabulously rich. That that will yes. open quite a few doors. Yes. Well, and I, th I think what you're saying actually makes him more interesting to a lot of people was because he was 19 when he shows up. And yes. he ends up in these positions because he's able to take his passion and show it to people in a way that they truly believe it. And... While, yes, he made some blunders that George Washington's literally said, don't do this, and he went and did it immediately. He was very much trusted by a lot of people who didn't even like each other. And in his defense, he did get out of those messes that he put himself 
<laughs> so that always helps when you clean up your own mess. You know, we're overlapping here a little bit. The reason he was important was that he was one of the richest and best connected men in France, although he had pissed a lot of people off when he left France to get here. But nonetheless, once Washington and the others figured out who he was, they desperately needed help from France. So that's what Lafayette was doing at the Battle of Barren Hill, Hill, which was in the spring after after Valley Forge. The French alliance had just been formed, but Lafayette was disgruntled because he hadn't had much to do and he'd been embarrassed in some ways. And so as far as I can tell, I mean, Washington did not write it down. The most likely thing is that Washington said, here, go out on what is essentially a training exercise. We'll give you 2,000 troops, which is more than he needed to do what he was told to do. And you take them out there and you be careful. Um, And he forgot the last part. But what he was doing there was political. It wasn't military. And a lot of things in the war, uh, Monmouth became a great victory because for our side, because it was framed that way politically after the battle. It was actually a stalemate. Both sides performed well, but it wasn't a victory, except by the, the... silly definition of the time, which is if you held the field of the battle and you were a victory, the British were on their way to New York. They didn't want to stick her in. Uh, anyway, you get you, you get my point about Lafayette. I like Lafayette. Lafayette is an attractive character. One of the interesting things about him, however, is that the French do not like him as much as we do, because his role in the French Revolution was quite complicated and problematic. It's not that he was a bad guy, but it's a very complicated story, and there's not an easy way to portray him as a hero of that. It's not a villain, but it's just more complicated. Whereas here, he came at 19, he helped us out, and then the other thing that people say about him, which I believe is true, is one of the reasons we love him so much is that he came back, was invited back to do a victory lap, in the, I forget, the 1820s, and he visited like everywhere in the United States, has everything is named after him and was treated as a hero of the revolution. And that just bolstered his, his fame in, in this country greatly. But I'm not knocking him. <laughs> now, was there any huge revolutionary myths that you were even shocked yourself when you got out there and started talking to people? Was there anything that popped up and you're like, wait, that's not how it really happened? Any of those pop up? Uh, yes. The one that I like to talk about because it's, it shocked me although it's not entirely untrue. I mean, it, let me just clarify that. But what you hear about Henry Knox is that Henry Knox went out to Fort Ticonderoga in the middle of winter, sent out by Washington during the siege of Boston early in the war, because they needed cannon, because how do you conduct a siege if you don't have cannon? So he went out there and he put the cannon on sleds, which were hauled by oxen and horses, although oxen are what it's usually referenced. And he brought them back to Boston and Washington put them up on the top of Dorchester Heights, which confusingly is in what's now South Boston. And the British looked up there and they thought, oh my God. And they made an attempt to get ready to go up and, and attack, which would have been disastrous. And then they came to their senses and left town. So Henry Knox's guns drove the British out of Boston. No, the British left Boston because they had been planning to leave Boston since the previous December. They needed permission from the Home Office to do that. But Boston was not a really good place to have a British army because the people around them were so hostile and there wasn't much they could accomplish. They wanted to be in New York. And so they were going to go to New York in the springtime, but they needed to get the boats together and whatever. And I learned this from David McCullough. Not personally, and not because he stated it bluntly, but I read his well-known and excellent book, 1776. And there's a point early on where he mentions that the British had decided to go to New York in December. And then he drops that. And then there's a very dramatic story at the end where the guns come in and they go up on, and, and there's a lot of drama in it. But I was like, wait. So uh, there's, a, there's a Henry Knox trail, which I followed in my book before I really figured this out. And there are dozens and dozens of markers with identical tests that say through this place passed Henry Knox with the cannon used to drive the British out of Boston. What can I say? I don't think it's true. 
What it did do again in term in political terms and in, and in just in ginning up enthusiasm, it appeared that Washington had driven the British out of Boston, and that was a great thing. That was a terrific thing. So that's why I say it's not really false, you know, in that sense. But that that that's that's a myth that that needs a little more correcting. Now you went to a lot of places. Was there any place that you ran out of time you couldn't get to? Was there any place you would have wanted to have gone that you weren't able to? Uh, many, many. Some of them I deliberately crossed off the list because I knew I wouldn't have time. I was going to have a whole chapter that was sort of more or less on the frontier war, and I just I couldn't. There is a battle in the South called Musgrove's Mill, and Jack Buchanan, John Buchanan who has written brilliantly about the war in the South, just recently published a, a short book on, on the Battle of Musgrove's Mill. And I drove right by it. You know, I knew it was there. I had an inkling that it was important. I didn't know how important it was. It was important less in itself than it was in, in sort of setting the groundwork for King's Mountain, which came later, and the, a, a lot of the people involved. But I would have loved to go there. I would have loved to go a lot of other places in the South, but um, not just the South, but um, I had a lot of people leaning on me to, to do my job in the South. And uh, jury's still out on whether they think I did or not. So. Bob, one of the things that I ask authors is there are people out there who look at history and say, this was a boring class I took in grade school. Why, why would I read a book about it? Now, I've, especially the American Revolution, they drill it into your head. Somebody says, I don't read history books. They're sitting in front of you, Bob, and they say, why should I read your book? What would you say? I would tell them to read chapter three, my book, the title of which is A Middle Finger Raised to the Powers That Be. And it's the story of Bunker Hill, and it's, story, it's the story of why the defenders positioned themselves where they did on Bunker Hill, where they were right up in the face of the British and daring them to attack. And it's just that one, that phrase is cribbed from a book that has nothing to do with the revolution, Revolution, just the, the notion of raising a middle finger to, to the powers that be, because the kids in Charlestown used to be pretty wild. Used to be. Uh, yeah, yeah, used to be. Um, I think they were wilder back when uh, Tony Lucas was writing about them. But uh, in any case, that's a, a long-winded way of saying that the reason you should read history, there's lots of reasons you should read history. But to say that you don't read it because it's boring means you're lazy because you haven't sought out books that aren't boring. You're not required to read boring books about anything unless it's your field of interest and you have to do that. I read a lot of boring books about the revolution because I needed to because I was writing about it. I needed the facts that were in the but It's a silly criticism. Well, I'm going to let them know, Bob. We might put that as our new tagline. Stop being lazy and read good history. Maybe that'll be the new one. <laughs> Listen, Bob, this, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, you're welcome. I was really happy to be here. And that's it for this episode. Bob, thank you so much for coming on Revolutionary Roads. Listen, it's a great book. Everybody, go out and get it. You'll enjoy it. In the meantime, hit us up Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, leave us ratings, listen to the podcast, tell all your friends, use our Amazon link if you're buying anything on there, get us a little kickback. Until next time, nerds, stay cool.